The morning of February the 11th was very cold, as Bernadette, her sister Toinette, and a friend, Jean Abadie, better known as Balloon, left the cashier to go and find sticks for firewood. The girls, dressed very much alike in peasant-style dresses and aprons, wore shawls around their shoulders, and their hair was covered with brightly patterned kerchiefs. Bernadette, for extra warmth, wore a white hooded cape. They walked down the Rue de Petit Fosse, past the old chateau fort, and made for the woods. Crossing the Roman bridge, they followed the river Gave until they came to the Ribeir Meadow. Here was an old rock, Massabielle, and although the girls had no liking for the area, they had been told that they would find good burning matter there, and also washed up in a cavern formed by the rocks, bones, which would fetch enough money to buy the whole Subaru family a meal. To reach the cavern, however, meant wading through the shallow Savi mill stream which joined the Gave. Bernadette, because of her asthmatic condition, lagged behind. By the time she reached them, Toinette and Baloum had already taken off their sabots and stockings and thrown them to the other side of the stream. Bernadette called after them, Wait, wait for me. The girls paid no heed as they stepped gingerly through the water, but Baloum shivered and cried out, Oh, it's so cold. Toinette screeched, Oh dear, it's freezing. Bernadette stood hesitating. Toinette, throw some big stones in the stream. Then I won't have to get my feet wet. You jolly well do the same as we had to, said Baloum. Now on the other side, the two girls dried their feet on their petticoats, quickly replaced their stockings and sabots, and then ran off together laughing. Bernadette, left by herself, thought for a moment, then kicked off her sabots and began removing her stockings. Hardly was the first one off when there was a murmur, followed by the sound of rushing wind. She looked around, but all was still, not a movement from the trees. Removing the other stocking, she was about to step into the water when the noise came again, just as if a storm were brewing. She looked all around again, and then towards the cave. Branches of a wild rose bush growing beneath an oval niche in the rock were shaking violently, and the niche itself was ringed with light. Inside stood a young lady. I must be dreaming, Bernadette rubbed her eyes. No, the, the lady's really there. Feeling frightened, Bernadette dropped to her knees, automatically pulled her rosary beads from her pocket, and went to make the sign of the cross. But for some reason, her arms felt heavy, and she couldn't. Then the lady made the sign of the cross, and Bernadette was able to do so, and she began to say the rosary. At this point, the two girls, laden with sticks, made their way to the cavern. Well, just look at her, kneeling there saying her prayers while we do all the work, said an angry balloon. Bernadette, Bernadette, said Toinette urgently. Receiving no reply, they picked up some pebbles and threw them towards the kneeling figure. Some hit her shoulder, but Bernadette remained motionless. Do you think she's dead? whispered Toinette. She's so white. Don't be stupid, said Balloon. She'd be lying down if she was. At this moment, Bernadette stood up, picked up her belongings, crossed the stream, and joined the girls. Why... It's as warm as dishwater, she said as she stepped out of the stream. Quickly replacing stockings and sabots, she gathered up a bundle of sticks and ran gaily on ahead. She didn't return by way of the meadow, but followed a steep winding track up the side of Massabielle. Toinette and Baloum looked at each other in amazement. Bernadette, Toinette called. They caught up with her. What happened to you, Toinette said. What made you say the rosary there? Bernadette smiled. It's good to pray anywhere. Balloon wasn't satisfied. Yes, but why there? Bernadette continued walking. Did you see anything? She asked the other two. No, we saw nothing. Not in the grotto. A little lady. Her companions shook their heads in bewilderment. Oh, she was so beautiful. She had a long white dress with a white veil over her head. She had a lovely white rosary in her hands. There was gold chain between the beads. Oh, her feet. On each foot, there was a golden rose. While I said the prayers, she ran the beads through her fingers, but her lips didn't move. But when I said the Gloria, she joined in. As soon as I'd finished the rosary, she disappeared. Oh, I do hope she comes back again. 
At the end of this disclosure, all three, busy with their own thoughts, remained silent until they'd reached the cashier. Then Bernadette said imploringly, Balloon, Toinette, please promise you won't tell anyone about the lovely little lady. Balloon was already running off to her own home. Bernadette raised her voice, Balloon, promise. Then, taking her sister's arms, they went through the heavy door, And you, Toinette? But this proved too difficult for Toinette. And that evening she told her mother, although for her trouble she received a spanking, and Bernadette was forbidden ever to go to Massabielle again. It wasn't as simple as that, however, for on Sunday the 14th, Bernadette told some of her friends sadly, I feel that I must go to Massabielle, but Mama and Papa have forbidden me. The girls weren't prepared to let a little thing like that stop some excitement, and they wasted no time in seeking out Francois and Louise Subaru and pestered them until they wearily gave in. After filling a small flask with holy water from church, Bernadette and half a dozen of her friends were off in a flash, over the top of Massabielle, down the rough zigzag track which a few days before Bernadette had so nimbly climbed, now she ran down it at an amazing speed. By the time her companions reached the bottom, she was already on her knees. They looked at their friend. They looked at each other. Then, shrugging their shoulders, they too knelt on the pebbly ground and joined her in the rosary. Within a few minutes, Bernadette stopped praying and softly said, She's here. She's here. One of her friends pushed the flask into her hands. Go on, sprinkle the holy water. It might be the devil. Bernadette rose slowly to her feet, took a few paces forward, and threw some of the holy water towards the niche and commanded, If you are the devil, go. If you come from God, stay. Bernadette's anxious face lit up. Oh, please stay. Returning to her place, she handed back the flask, sank to her knees, and then gazed at the niche. Look, Toinette said, look at her face. It's like wax. Balloon took this up. Her eyes, look at her eyes. And the other girls chorused, she's dead. No, she's not, Toinette quietened them. But she must be ill. That's how she looked last time. Quick, qu quickly, go and get our mamma. Too frightened to argue, Balloon ran to the cashier while another went to the nearby savvy mill for help. Antoine Niccolo, the miller, was first on the scene, and lifting the slight figure in his strong arms, and with the rest of the girls in tow, he carried her back to his house. When he put her down, she regained consciousness, and the colour flowed back into her cheeks. Everyone assembled in the kitchen. A few minutes later, a dishevelled balloon led Bernadette's distraught mother through the door. They were followed by the dignified figure of Madame Mie, a wealthy lady for whom Louise Subaru worked. When she saw her daughter safe and sound, and looking well into the bargain, her anger got the better of her, and taking the girl by the shoulders, she shook her violently. Madame Mier intervened. Stop it, Louise. Stop it at once. I, I don't think your girl's making this up. And what's more, next time she wants to go to Massabielle, I'll go with her. And so she did, and her dressmaker friend went too. It was on Thursday, February the 18th, and Bernadette knelt in the cavern between the two adults, one held a lighted candle, the other writing equipment. The rosary beads slipped one by one through Bernadette's fingers. Suddenly, she was still. She's here. Pen and paper were thrust into Bernadette's hands, and she was urged to go and ask the lady her name and what she wanted. She did, but the paper remained blank. The women stared at the niche and saw nothing. On the way home, Bernadette explained and not knowing what to call the apparition, used the word akero, meaning the thing. When I walked towards her, akero went further back into the niche, and then she was standing on the ground right in front of me. I asked her to write down those things you wanted to know, but she only smiled. And then she said to me, what I have to say need not be put down in writing. Will you do me the favor of coming here each day for the next two weeks? The favour, Madame Mia exclaimed. What did you say? Oh, I said yes. After I've asked permission of my parents, that is. And then she said, I do not promise to make you happy in this world, but in the next. Naturally enough, when Louise heard about this latest episode, she was simply furious. 
You're not to go near that place again, do you hear me? It's bad enough being the poorest family in Lua without you adding to the misery. People are saying you're crazy. But, Mama, I must go. I promised to Caro. Louise threw up her hands in resignation, which Bernadette took as a scent. Sunday the 21st turned out to be a long and tiring day for the young girl. Accompanied by her aunts, Basile and Bernard, she set off earlier than usual to keep her appointment. It went without incident, and although jostled and questioned by many present, she said nothing. Whatever went on between her and her lady remained a secret. But the day was only just beginning for Bernadette. When she reached the cashier, Louise sent her daughter straight out again. Abbe Penn, one of the curates, wanted to speak to her. After lunch, as was customary, the family went to Vespers. But today there was something more. When the congregation came out of church, Monsieur Jacomet, the chief of police, immaculate in his well-fitting uniform, barred the way. He was very much the imposing figure he looked. Taking no notice of anyone else, he accosted Bernadette. Will you kindly step along to my office? I won't keep you long. Ignoring the shouts of abuse that followed him, he marched Bernadette along the street and ushered her into his office. Sitting down at a huge brown desk, he idly leafed through some letters. After what he considered a suitable time, he took a piece of official paper and with pen poised asked, What's your name? Bernadette Subaru, monsieur. How old are you? Fourteen, uh, going on fifteen. What? And you're still at school in the infant's class? Uh, right. I want every detail about this business at Massabiel, and uh, mind, no lies, because I'm writing it all down. Well, monsieur, a lady comes to see me. What lady? How old is she? I, I don't know. But she's a very beautiful lady. About seventeen or eighteen, I suppose. Is she a lady from Lourdes? Oh, no, monsieur. More beautiful than any lady I've ever seen in Lourdes. How can that be? There are plenty of lovely ladies in Lourdes. <clears throat> anyway, go on. What did the lady wear? She had a, a long white dress with a blue sash that came down to the bottom. There was a white veil over her head. And this lady, does she stand still? Oh, no. She moves gracefully. Her arms, her body, her head. And she smiles. And she speaks to you? How is it that you hear her and others don't? Then, touching her heart, Bernadette answered, It's in here she speaks. Uh, she gives you messages. What are they? Well, some of them I tell people, but, but the others are for me alone. Oh, come on now. Repeat them to me. I want to know every one. I'm sorry, monsieur. I, I can't tell the secret ones. I will not disobey the lady. Jacobus slammed his fist down on the desk. Tell me, or I'll send you straight to prison. Bernadette smiled. Be sure the bars are strong, monsieur. Otherwise, I might escape. Jacomet's face turned purple. All right, I'll read back your statement. Then you must sign it. And this lady of yours is about um, 20 to 22 years old. No, monsieur, I told you she is about 17 or 18. Mm. She wears a blue dress and a white sash. No, 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 monsieur, I did not say that. Her dress is white and the sash blue. You said white. No, blue. Um, the lady stands still like a statue in church. Monsieur, monsieur, you have not written down what I said. By this time, Jacomet had had enough. He dismissed Bernadette and told her not to go to Massabiel again. Defying his orders, Bernadette went to the grotto the next day. But to her dismay, the lady did not put in an appearance. Bernadette was not disappointed on February the 23rd, and neither were the hundred or more onlookers when at 6 a.m. she arrived at the grotto with her Aunt Bernard. Bernadette knelt for about an hour, and during this time she smiled, bowed, and from time to time made the beautiful sign of the cross for which she was renowned. As before, when it was all over, she returned home thoughtful and quiet. The following day, those present at the grotto were in the region of two hundred. They watched Spellbound, 
Many were overcome by the beauty of her entranced face. And then, without warning, she began to cry. This time she did not ignore those who questioned her. With tears streaming down her face, she told them, The lady said, Penance, 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 pray for sinners. Jacomet was now really put out by the increasing numbers going to Massabiel, so he summoned the entire constabulary of Lourdes, hoping to frighten the followers of Bernadette Subaru away. But he reckoned without the hundreds present on this Thursday. Silently, they stood in a large semicircle around the grotto. The object of their attention was in her usual position, but today she surprised them all by suddenly moving along on her knees over the pebbly ground. She went towards the savvy mill stream, hesitated, changed direction, and made for the garve. Then she stopped, unsure of what to do next, stared up at the niche, and still on her knees, shuffled back towards the cavern. After looking all around it, she went to a corner and began scratching the ground like an animal, and then she seemed to vomit. When she turned towards the people, her face was covered with mud. Bernadette later explained to her family and friends. This time, the lady was very solemn. She told me to go and drink at the spring and wash there. Well, I, I didn't really know what she meant. You see, she speaks to me in our own dialect, and so I thought she might have confused spring with brook. So that's why I went to the river. But she called me back. No, not the garb, please. So I looked towards her, and she repeated what I was to do, pointed to a corner of the cave and added, And eat some of the plants. So that's why I was digging in the corner. There was a drop of muddy water, and that's what I drank and washed my face with. I also ate some blades of grass, like she said. That made me sick. The crowds, feeling that they'd been duped, quickly dispersed. Not one of them noticed the thin trickle of water welling its way up through the muddy patch where Bernadette had been digging. next day, Bernadette went to the grotto as usual, but the lady did not come. The day after this, she did, and the crowds were there again in full force. After the ecstasy, she told the people, The lady told me to kiss the ground as an act of penance for sinners. Three days later, with her aunts Basile and Bernard either side of her, Bernadette made for the presbytery. There in his rose garden, and with his breviary in his hand sat the parish priest, Abbe Perimal. What do you want? Who are you? Bernadette. Bernadette Subaru. Well, what do you want? The lady. What lady? The lady who visits me at Massa Biel. You mean uh, a lady from Lourdes? No, I don't know who she is, but she's not from Lourdes. What's her name? I don't know. She never told me. She said to tell you she wants people to come in procession. What? Before he could say anything else, Bernadette bobbed a curtsy and with her two aunts left with some speed. The trio had not gone very far when Bernadette stopped. Oh, my goodness, I didn't give him all the message. It wasn't until evening that Bernadette plucked up the courage to return. This time it was even harder. The curates were with the abbey. Nevertheless, she spoke out clearly. Um, Monsieur le Curé, I forgot to tell you, the lady said she wants a chapel built. The good abbe's face turned scarlet. Do you have the money for this chapel? You tell your lady if she wants a chapel, she better give you the money. Bernadette curtsied and was about to leave. His voice stopped her. Uh, wait. Uh, you tell this lady of yours I want a sign. Um, tell her to make the wild rose bloom in the cavern and find out the name of your precious lady. The lady had asked Bernadette to come every day for two weeks. Those two weeks were up and Bernadette stopped going to the grotto, but the people didn't. They went in procession carrying lighted candles, they set the rosary and they kissed the ground. From the spring, now directed into a basin by the quarriers, they washed, 
drank and filled bottles. Belief in the apparitions also showed in the increased numbers at Mass and Confession. During this time, a man by the name of Bouliet regained the sight in his blind eye when he placed a piece of moist earth from the spring on it. And a two-year-old child, Justin Bouhohor, dying from consumption and convulsions, was instantaneously cured when his mother dipped him in the water. And so, twenty days passed, though not without incident. The lady was doing things her way, which were far more significant than making a wild rose bloom. Mama, Mama, Bernadette whispered, shaking her mother. Quickly, we must go at once. What, at this hour? Yes, yes, we must go. Wearily, Louise and Francois crawled out of bed, left the cachot, and accompanied their daughter on the long, bleak walk to the other side of town. It was March the 25th, the Feast of the Annunciation, and Massabiel, even at this unearthly hour of 5 a.m., was crowded. Everyone firmly believed the lady would come today. Thus, when Bernadette arrived, excitement filled the air. Bernadette knelt and started to pray. After some time, while still entranced, she stood, took a few steps forward, stopped, stretched her arms in front of her, and then, regaining consciousness, and to the astonishment of her parents and the onlookers, she pushed her way through and ran, over the tiny Savio Mill Bridge, crossing the Garve by the old Roman bridge, along the deserted road by the wood, she sped up the stony path to the village, past the church of Saint-Pierre, and then she was at the priest's house. Rushing past the housekeeper who opened the door, she burst into the room where the abbe was sitting, and without any greeting, panted, I am the Immaculate Conception. What? Where are your manners? Who said you could come in unannounced? Bobbing a curtsy, Bernadette began again. Monsieur le curé, the lady said, I am the Immaculate Conception. The abbe's face drained of colour. What on earth are you talking about? The lady, mon père, she told me her name. Then, opening her arms wide, Bernadette placed them across her chest, lifted her eyes towards the ceiling, and breathed, I am the Immaculate Conception. You asked? The abbe was quieter now. Oh, yes, I kept on asking until she told me. I put out my arms toward her and implored, Please, please, madame, what is your name? The lady's smile faded, and she became serious. She stretched her arms towards the ground, and brought them up, and crossed them over her chest, and then raised her eyes to the sky, and said, I am the Immaculate Conception. Then she disappeared. Two weeks after her momentous visit to the presbytery, Bernadette was reunited with her lady. This time, the local doctor witnessed the ecstasy. He reported the incident to Abbe Perima. That young Subaru girl, she held a lighted candle in her right hand and rosary beads in her left. Her features were really death-like. Then I noticed that the candle had slipped downward and the flame licked her fingers for a full ten minutes. I timed it. The amazing thing is, you know, there's no trance that can resist the agony of fire. I examined her after, and there wasn't a trace of a burn. And I thought to myself, I'll try a little experiment, and I took a lighted candle from someone and touched it to her hand. She screamed and said, Why do you want to burn me? Well, if I hadn't seen it for myself, I'd never have believed it. After this day... Bernadette stopped going to the grotto, but life remained troublesome. She was pestered continually by people who asked silly questions and who offered money for blessings, which Bernadette angrily refused. At school, the situation was different, but just as uncomfortable. The girls were embarrassed in her company, and her teacher, Sister Vazou, treated her with contempt. But only one thing mattered to Bernadette. 
her First Communion. She spent every possible moment learning her catechism. On June the 3rd, the Feast of Corpus Christi, she achieved her ambition, and after this she was enrolled as a child of Mary. On being asked, what gave you most joy, receiving God in communion or talking to the Blessed Virgin, she replied, I don't know. The two things go together and can't be separated. All I know is that I was happy both times. The mayor of Lourdes was having ideas of his own around this time. He planned to capitalize on the newly discovered spring water and turn Lourdes into a spa resort. He was simply furious at the way people were bathing and taking away bottles of water without paying a thing. So, using as an excuse the excitable scenes at the grotto, and that the water might be harmful to people's health, he had Massabiel barricaded and closed to the public. No sooner were the barricades in place than the townspeople pulled them down, but just as quickly the gendarmes had them up again, and so it went on. But on July the 16th, the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, the barricades were well and truly in place. Bernadette, sitting alone in a meadow during the early evening of that day, suddenly felt her heart flutter. It's the lady. She's calling me. Springing to her feet, she ran towards the town. Halfway there, she stopped. I don't want to tell anyone. I want to be alone with her. Unfortunately for Bernadette, some ardent followers had been keeping watch on her, and now seeing her haste, quickly spread the news from house to house. Bernadette's going to the grotto. With Bernadette's change of mind came a change of direction, and instead of taking her usual short route, she followed the one used at the time of the first apparition, when, together with Baloum and Toinette, she went to gather firewood, past the old chateau fort, across the tiny savvy mill bridge, and on to the Ribeir Meadow. Crowds followed in her wake, and as she knelt, she motioned them to stay well away. This they did, excepting her mother, who knelt just a little way behind her daughter. Bernadette looked towards the niche away in the distance, but only the upper part showed above the barricades. Her distressed gaze searched the area and came to rest on the bank of the Gave, near where it joins the Savi stream. Bernadette rubbed her eyes, just as she had on February the 11th. The silent, reverent gathering, who had formed a semicircle around her, saw the kneeling girl's face turn pale and her skin go taut, while the brown eyes widened and became glazed. The lady, Bernadette told her family later that night, was more dazzling and vivacious than ever before. The golden roses on her feet were brilliant, and her veil and hair flowed freely. Her smile was more loving. I went to say my rosary, but the lady put her fingers to her lips as if to say, Be still, be quiet, you'll have plenty of time for that when I've gone. Night had set in, and still Bernadette stared rapturously at the beauty of her lady. Then, slowly, very slowly, the dazzling brightness faded, so that the girl was hardly aware of it. She raised her hand to wave. Then there was nothing only the darkness of night. She knelt on a little longer, reassuring herself that her lovely lady had gone. Then, slowly dragging herself to her feet, she staggered towards her mother. Louise took her sorrowful child in her arms, gently covering her with a warm cloak. No words were necessary. She could tell from her daughter's tear-filled eyes that the lady would never return. Abbe Perimal was a formidable character. Strong-looking, thick-set, a man whose expansive girth made him appear above average height. His bald head accentuated a long, rectangular face, and what little hair remained was white and stood up in tufts around the side and back of his head. When someone ruffled him, his deep-set eyes were as blazing fire, and he had a voice and temper to match. Usually, his movements were slow and ponderous, but today, this man in his late forties paced up and down like a caged animal, frequently glancing at the clock. A gentle knock on his study door brought him to a halt. In spite of himself, he felt rage welling up inside him, as sitting down he called, Come in. 
Then, making an effort, he said to the girl who entered, uh, How are you, my child? Uh, come and sit down. Bernadette had never really recovered from her early encounters with this gruff man, and now she sat stiffly on the edge of the chair. Um, I want to ask you one or two questions. Uh, please answer me as simply and truthfully as you can. Now then, this lady, what did you say her name was? Tell me again. She said, Monsieur Le Curé, I am the Immaculate Conception. Oh, come, come, girl. No one could say any words like that. Someone must have put the idea into your head. Tell the truth now. Who was it? No one, Monsieur Le Curé. I never heard it before. You mean you made it up? No, no, mon père. The lady said it. Ah, you probably heard it at school. I expect Sister Vazou told you. Bernadette shook her head. Uh, do you know what it means? Bernadette sat quietly trying to think. Then, no, I have no idea. Then I'll tell you. It means this. On December the 8th, four years ago, the Holy Father proclaimed to the whole world the doctrine that the Blessed Virgin Mary, from the very first moment of her conception in her mother's womb, was preserved from the stain of original sin, a privilege and a grace granted by God on account of the merits of Jesus Christ. Is that clear to you? I'm sorry, mon père. I still don't understand. Oh, Bernadette, why don't you confess that you lie and then we can all go back and lead normal, peaceful lives again? How can I say a thing like that when I'm telling the truth? The man felt tortured. But pulling himself together, he stood up and went towards the door. Very well, my child. You may go. With a sigh of resignation, he closed the door after her. This had been his last attempt to get to the truth. He had already questioned Sister Vazou, and she said there was nothing about the Immaculate Conception in the school syllabus. Neither had she taught it, and the curates assured him that they too had never told Bernadette anything about it. If this were a hoax, why didn't she just say that she saw Mary, the Mother of God, or even the Blessed Virgin? But to call the lady by a name that she'd never heard, or even understood. Another thought struck him. If this were the mother of God, then he was failing to carry out her commands. After all, she had answered his requests, given her name, and then there were plenty of signs. The Buhuhor child miraculously cured, and Dr. Duzo's conversion since the candle episode. He had certainly declared her to be an authentic visionary. The abbe decided to act. But all his attempts to have the guards removed and the barricades pulled down failed miserably and he realized he would have to see the bishop at nearby Tarb. A few days later, at the bishop's residence, the abbe reported on the chain of events at the grotto. Well, we've certainly acted wisely in keeping our noses out of this business, said the bishop. And may I say, my dear Perimal, how much I admire you for keeping clear of it all. Ah, your lordship, my appointment with you today was not just to report what has been happening, but really to tell you how much my conscience is bothering me. I think it's time the church did something about it. This is a curious change of attitude, Perimal. I must confess, my lord, that in the beginning I thought the girl was quite mental, then a good actress, but now I have my doubts. Every time I look into those eyes of hers, I'm convinced that she is being used by God. Just who is this Bernadette Subaru? Well, she's a common, low-born girl, my lord. Very plain features, never a trace of color in her face. But those eyes, having once looked into them, you never forget. I don't know, they, they seem to haunt you. My parishioners are filled with uncertainty. The people and gendarmerie are at each other's throats. Please, my lord, I beg you, call together a commission to investigate all the happenings at Lourdes. Ah, said the bishop, the plans for an Episcopal commission have already been completed, but I hope I'll never have to give the order to go ahead. I, I don't understand. The grotto is barred, isn't it? Well, then, how do you expect a commission to examine the cavern and the spring? Now, ah, you tell me that. But, but surely you can command the local dignitaries to open it up? Never. I'll not interfere in this matter. The Emperor knows about this disturbance. Let him do something about it. Uh, but surely, my lord, 
You know the Emperor's feelings. He'll not put himself or the relations between church and state in jeopardy. I've heard it said that his only comment is, these people must manage their own affairs. I quite agree with him. There's nothing I can do. The bishop rang a bell to summon his manservant, indicating that the interview was at an end. And then he delivered his parting words. The commission will assemble when the emperor commands that the barriers be removed and the grotto open to the public. And only then. If this lady is the mother of God, then she can quite easily overcome an emperor. If she isn't, then the grotto will stay closed and that will be an end to the matter. Napoleon III, Emperor of France, had already acted. He had sent a message to the Chief of Police at Lourdes telling him to leave Massabielle unguarded, sure that the people would pull down the barricades themselves and thus save the face of the civil authorities. But for some reason, they hadn't done so. Determined to be rid of the matter once and for all, the Emperor sent a message by telegraph. It read, Access to the grotto west of Lourdes is to be immediately granted to the public. The barricades were down at last. The Bishop of Tarbes, Monseigneur Laurence, surprised everyone when, in a pastoral letter, he verified that the visions and healings at Lourdes were supernatural, at the same time pointing out that unless money was provided, the lady's wishes would remain unfulfilled. After this, money poured in from all over the world, and in less than two weeks, two million francs had reached the bishop, who immediately appointed Abbe Perimau to administer the building of a chapel. The municipal authorities sold him the land and caverns of Massabielle, and building began. The abbe also became the self-appointed protector of Bernadette. He unearthed many plots to put her in prison, and on one occasion he quashed an attempt to have her committed to a mental asylum. With Bernadette, the whole Subaru family came under his wing. He had them moved from the cashier to more comfortable quarters at a nearby mill, and here Bernadette had a room to herself. Even so, she was still plagued by visitors, and after two years the abbe persuaded the sisters who taught her at the hospice to take her as a boarder. About this time, Sister Vazou was recalled to the mother house at Nevers. Bernadette worked hard, and although study wasn't easy for her, she progressed. So much so that when the bishop inquired after her, Abbe Perimal said, My lord, she has grown up into a very fine young lady. All the rough characteristics are gone, and everything about her develops in an outstanding way. Towards the end of her fourth year, she received one of many visits from the abbe. Now he looked with great love and affection at the tranquil girl who sat facing him. Bernadette, are you happy? What do you intend doing with your life? Yes, Monsieur le Curé, I am quite happy. Perhaps I could take a job as a maid in one of the big houses in the town. Oh, Bernadette, do you realize what you're saying? Don't you understand what the result of the commission means? It is judged that Mary, the Immaculate Mother of God, appeared to you eighteen times at the Grotto of Massabiel. Why, at this moment, all the information and papers regarding the investigation are with our Holy Father in Rome. How could you possibly imagine yourself out in the world? Hasn't it occurred to you that your name could go down in history and be remembered after you die? Oh, no, monsieur. Surely this cannot be. My dear, you are happy enough living among the sisters. Wouldn't you like to be one of them and stay with them for good? Oh, no, mon père. I'm not good enough for that. I'm far better suited to working in the kitchen. I'm quite good at peeling vegetables, you know. Um, I want you to give this uh, a lot of thought, Bernadette. But of your own free will, you must choose it. Bernadette did think and pray, and finally decided to join the community of the Sisters of Nevers as a nun. Because of her continuing poor health, it was to be two years before she left Lourdes forever. The journey to the mother house at Nevers took several weeks. On arrival, she was greeted by the mother superior, Josephine Imbert, who was accompanied by another nun. Uh, tell me, said mother Imbert, what is your name? I've forgotten. Bernadette Subaru, Madame la Superieure, she replied. 
Indicating the other woman, Mother Imbert said, This is Sister Bazou, mistress of the novices. From now on, you'll be in her care. Trying hard to conceal her distaste for the girl, the other nun simply said, We are acquainted with one another. Well now, what name shall we call you? asked the Mother Superior. Bernadette looked blank. Well, you certainly don't think we'll call you Bernadette, do you? says Sister Bazo acidly. Wait now, Mother Imbert interrupted. What's the name of your godmother? It's Aunt Bernard, madame. Oh, good, that settles it. You shall be known as Sister Marie Bernard. And so Bernadette Subaru started her life as a postulant and was swallowed up in the community life of the convent of saint Gildas, Nevers. Bernadette suffered all her life. A cholera epidemic and the famine which followed in its wake when she was but a toddler left her permanently weak, and so she remained for the rest of her 35 years. Frequent bouts of asthma were further aggravated by the deplorable conditions of the cacho, and Bernadette spent much time in her bed. At the convent in Nevers, it was no different. There was no relief from the arduous day's work required by the strict discipline and the effects of the early years of malnutrition gradually took their toll. Her wasted body developed tuberculosis, and the slow decaying of her bones resulted in excruciating pain, and she became easily exhausted after only the lightest of tasks. The lady had said, I do not promise to make you happy in this world, but in the next. Her bed in the infirmary of saint Gildas convent was never long without his occupant, and this caused her superior to say half-jokingly one day, What are you doing in bed, you lazy little thing? Why, dear mother, I am doing my work. And what is your work, may I ask? It is to be ill. These words can be a great comfort to the thousands of sick and handicapped who annually visit Lourdes. Theirs is a sublime vocation often discovered at the shrine itself. So many find new hope in the realization that, like Bernadette, they do have a use in life. Our Lady has something to say to everyone who visits her shrine, but so few give her the chance. Quiet moments are rare, and it is all too easy to become swept up in a round of crowded activities and excursions. Yet, time can be found. After the torchlight procession, vast crowds go to the grotto and say good night to Our Lady and then return to their hotels. At the grotto, all is still and tranquil. The pyramid of candles flickers and splutters, and the fast-flowing garve lowers its voice. Trees rustle, and the night air brushes the face in a cool embrace. Here in the candle glow are seen the example of young and old alike. Some kneel with outstretched arms, while others stand mesmerized, gazing at the niche. Others sit side by side on the seats under the rock of Massabiel for an all-night vigil. It is at times like this when, without distraction, one can more easily feel the presence of the Immaculate Mother of God. It is easier to realize how selfish we are, or how full of pride, greed, and so many other emotions which rule our lives. Then... Our Lady's words really begin to make their full impression. Penance, penance, penance. Pray for poor sinners. This was the only message Bernadette directed to the crowds who were there during the apparitions. It is the message of Lourdes. There is no other. It was as the result of her actions during the ninth apparition that Bernadette was taken by many to be a charlatan. What else were the hundreds of onlookers to think? They saw her on her knees kissing the rough pebbly ground, scratching away at the earth, eating grass, and smearing her face with muddy water. With the flowing of the spring, however, the importance of penance was grasped by many, and the people began imitating Bernadette's actions. And so, on the rough pebbly stage of a disused cavern, the penitential phase began in Lourdes, a phase which continues to the present day.
Pilgrims kneel and pray in front of the niche and quite unashamedly kiss the ground before large audiences. They also clamber around the side of a mountain, following the stations of the cross, a timely reminder of the sufferings Mary's son endured to save us. But the penance most dreaded in Lourdes is the baths. During the pilgrimage season, hundreds go into the baths daily, accepting that it is necessary to queue for hours, strip almost naked in front of strangers, and then to be dipped into breathtakingly cold water that has already been used by numerous others before them. Adding to the discomfort, clothing has to be dragged back on to dripping wet bodies. One person said, It really is true humiliation when you know that so many people have been in there before you with all manner of different diseases. You just put your trust completely in God that you won't catch anything. It's a real penance. Praiseworthy though these voluntary penances are, they should not distract us from the essential practice of penance found in our daily lives. It is an obvious fact that none of us need go looking for penance. Troubles, pain, heartache, injustice, they're all part of our common lot. And each day brings its share of distasteful and irksome tasks. But they need not be wasted. And it is in this respect that Bernadette's example matters most. Never once did she rebel or complain against God. Never did she try to justify herself. She accepted everything, always seeing in each situation God's will for her. In the convent at Nevers, she was heard to say, I would rather lie sick on my bed than be a queen seated on a throne. And on another occasion, If by lying ill in bed for a day I can save a sinner, then I would willingly spend the rest of my life there. People, when in Lourdes, carry out Our Lady's command to do penance. The same goes for prayer, too. No matter where one goes, be it in the domain or while walking through the town, people of all ages carry or even wear rosary beads. In each of the eighteen apparitions, Our Lady appeared with rosary beads over her arm, and Bernadette said her rosary. That the rosary was recited is not perhaps so significant as the fact that Bernadette was being encouraged to pray. This help to pray is so necessary in our hectic lives. Very few of us pray regularly. For most, it is no easy task. One pilgrim to Lourdes summed up quite candidly what we all feel at some time or other. To pray is the hardest thing in the world, and the most tiring. It's very difficult, isn't it? There are times when I feel there is a starvation. My mind won't function at all. Well, we're in good company. For it is common knowledge that after many years as a nun, Bernadette never became proficient at meditation. But the prayer to which she remained faithful, and which aided her along the road to sanctity, was none other than the one taught her by Our Lady, the simple rosary, said with recollection and love. Once Mary had delivered her message for the world and given examples of how it was to be carried out, her work was done and she revealed her name. In the remaining visions, she and Bernadette simply took pleasure in being together. Possibly during these last encounters, this backward girl was being prepared by the Mother of God for the first meeting with her son in the Eucharist. And this Bernadette did when she made her first communion. On handing over her young servant to her son Jesus, Mary faded into the background, just as she does during the Blessed Sacrament procession. There can be no mistaking the excitement this event generates in the domain each afternoon. The loud pealing of bells from the Basilica Tower indicates that our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament is on his way from the grotto. Mary steps discreetly aside. The thousands who have accepted her invitation to come to Lourdes, she now hands over to her son, just as she did Bernadette. As the procession starts, so do the hosannas and the songs of praise. But among the throngs of voices, others can be heard. Lord, that I may hear. Lord, that I may see. Lord, we believe. Increase our faith. Only say the word, and I shall be healed. The applause eases to a hush when the procession reaches Rosary Square, 
Who can tell what will happen? At the blessing of the sick, people have been known to get up from their beds and walk. Some accept their cross. For others, there is a greater commitment, a conversion of heart. But there are those who will look on and remain unmoved. Some will walk away disillusioned. For those who are helped, however, Lourdes fulfills a unique role. There is a statue placed halfway up the zigzag path near the grotto. It is of a blind man who, kneeling, rests his chin on a vertical beam of a rough wooden cross. The inscription tells that the statue was donated by a blind Italian lady. These are her words. I came here to regain my sight, but I regained something much more important, my faith. There is no mistaking the great love pilgrims have for Our Lady, which is expressed when they walk in the evening torchlight procession and join their voices to the thousands of others singing the lured Ave Maria. When passing her crown statue, they know that although a queen, she is not unapproachable. She is not really standing on a pedestal to be admired from afar. She is also our mother. Bernadette was always at home in her presence and remarked on the gracious smile and warmth of her lady. When she spoke of the apparition which took place on the Feast of the Annunciation, Bernadette referred to her in these words. She was smiling and looking at the crowd like a loving mother watching her children. And this is how we come to see Mary. Her vocation was in saying yes to becoming the mother of God. And her vocation is still to be a mother, ours. A mother's joy is to bring up children to be like her, perhaps even exceed her. This is what she wants of us all. Her greatness was in letting God take over. For the Almighty has done great things to me. It is in this way that she wants us to imitate her. The girl seated between two nuns on the hard wooden seat was very still and upright as the train rattled and bumped along the track. A tapestry travelling bag and an enormous cerise-coloured umbrella rested against the skirt of the smart dress she was wearing. Dark hair escaping from a patterned kerchief over her head seemed only to emphasise the pallor of her face, and so did the dark, fathomless eyes. Oblivious of the nuns and of the two girls, Leontine Moret, and Marie Laurati, who made up the rest of the party, Bernadette Subaru recalled her departure from Lourdes earlier on this Wednesday morning of July the 4th, 1866. At the station seeing her off were her parents, her sister Toinette, two of her aunts, Basile and Bernard, and some of her close friends. Her mother had been beside herself with grief as she clung to her 22-year-old daughter. Gently releasing herself, Bernadette said, Mama, Mama, please don't distress yourself so much. After all, Never is not the other side of the world. You can always come and see me, you know. Oh, I don't know, Bernadette. I feel as though I'd never see you again. Francois Subaru, trying to calm his wife, said, Come now, Louise, you're being overdramatic. Now, Bernadette, it's time for you to go. Give your mother a kiss and don't keep the good sisters waiting any longer. Tears flowed and handkerchiefs were very much in evidence as the heavy steam train moved laboriously out of the station. Following the River Garve, it passed by a great mass of rock known as Massa Biel. In an oval niche of a grotto stood a pure white statue of the Madonna. A pyramid of candles burned brightly nearby. The top of the rock had been levelled out and foundations laid. There was, however, one building in evidence, a small, newly built chapel. Looking across to the grotto, Bernadette's heart ached even more as she said her silent farewell to what she felt was her own private heaven. Now, escorted by Mother Alexandrine, the superior from the hospice at Lourdes, and Mother Ursula, a superior from another convent, she and the two other girls were on their way to the convent of saint Gilda to join the Sisters of Charity and Christian Instruction at Nevers. The journey was to be a long one and it entailed changing trains and overnight stops along the route. The first of these was at Bordeaux, where they spent two days. 
and then to Perigou. Though the train was slow with many stops and the heat and smells intense, there was no question of boredom. They prayed and discussed all they had seen during their travels, and on the final stage of their journey, the superiors told the three aspirants the history of the order which they were about to join. At the end of this story, Leontine said, I wonder which house I'll be sent to when I'm professed. Hmm, said Marie, we'll each be given a job to do. Wonder what mine will be. Bernadette said nothing. She had no need to wonder, for as far as she was concerned, she considered herself to be useless. At 10.30 that night, the train came to a halt at the platform of Nevers station, and the nuns wasted no time in shepherding their charges off to the waiting carriage and pair which transported them at great speed through the dark and deserted streets. As they approached the convent, the driver suddenly turned left. Bypassing the front gate, he went in through a side entrance and deposited his passengers in the courtyard. They gained admission to the building through a door at the top of some steps by the kitchen. Several nuns waited to greet them. After a light supper, the new arrivals were led through the sleeping convent to their dormitory. On the afternoon of the following day, all the novices and postulants of the community assembled in the great hall of the novitiate. Also present were the sisters of the two other houses in Nevers, which had been specially invited along. It had been decided that Bernadette Subaru should give an account of an experience she had had at Lourdes. The Mother General, Josephine Imbert, presided. Beside her sat Sister Marie-Thérèse Vazou, the mistress of the novices, and the two superiors from the Pyrenees, Mothers Alexandrine and Ursula, who were to act as counsellors. Clothed as she had arrived in a blue striped dress with a little scarf tied Pyrenees fashion over her head, Bernadette faced three hundred religious. Now, said Mother Imbert, Tell us exactly what happened. While I was out in the woods one day, I saw a beautiful lady standing on a niche in an old cavern. She wore a white dress and a blue girdle around her waist, and she had a... Wait a minute, wait a minute, Mother Imbert interrupted. Now speak more slowly and tell us what you were doing in the woods. Were you alone? No, madam, I was not by myself. My sister Toinette was with me, and so was a friend, Jeanne Abadie and we went out to get some sticks for firewood. We were very poor, madame. My father was out of work. Yes, yes, said Mother Imbe. What happened then? Well, we left the cachot, that's the old prison where we were living at the time, and going by way of the Savi Mill came to the Ribert Meadow. Toinette and Jeanne Abadie quickly crossed the little Savi stream and went past the old cavern of Massa Biel and ran off together laughing. You see, I was so much slower than they because of my asthma, Anyway, I took off my sabots and began removing my stockings when suddenly I heard a murmur and then a sound of rushing wind. It was just like when a storm is blowing up. I looked all around, but everything was still. There wasn't a movement from the trees. I heard the sound again and looked towards the cave. Then I noticed that a wild rose which was growing beneath the niche was shaking violently and the niche itself was ringed with light. Inside stood a young lady. She wore a long white dress with a blue sash around her waist, and over her hair there was a veil. On each foot there was a golden rose, and she held a white rosary. It had a gold chain between each bead. I couldn't believe my eyes, and so I rubbed them because I thought I was imagining it. But no! The lady was really there. I felt frightened and just knelt down and tried to make the sign of the cross, but I couldn't. My hands felt so heavy. Then the lady made the sign of the cross, and I was able to do so. After that, I took the rosary out of my pocket and began to say the prayers. Although she ran the beads through her fingers, the lady's lips didn't move except at the glorias. When I'd finished saying the rosary, the lady disappeared. Did the lady speak to you? asked Mother Imbert. No, not this time. Not, in fact, until the third time I saw her. And what did she say? She asked me if I'd do her the favour of going to Massa Biel every day for the next two weeks. And she also said, I wouldn't be happy in this world, but in the next. Then she told me that people were to do penance 
and to pray for sinners. She also had me do some penitential acts. When was this? asked Mother Imbe. It was the ninth time I'd seen her, on February the 25th. This time the meeting was different. She said to me, go and drink at the spring and wash there. I was very puzzled about this command, but I thought maybe the lady who was speaking in our regional dialect might have confused spring with brook, and so I went towards the river. But she called me back. No, not to the garf, please. I turned back towards the niche, and the lady repeated what I was to do. Indicating with her finger, she added, and eat some of the plants you will find in the cave. So I went to the corner of the cave and found a damp patch, and began digging with my hands. A little drop of muddy water appeared, just about enough to fill a wine glass. I looked at it, and the lady told me again to drink and wash. I scooped up some of the water with my hands, but it was so muddy that I threw away three lots before I was able to drink any. Then I attempted to wash my face, and afterwards I ate some of the grass. It seems to me, said Mother Alexandrine, that you did not act with much humility. That's right, interrupted Sister Vazou. You threw away three lots of water. But, Mother, the water was very dirty. Please continue. The next time the lady came, she said she wanted people to come in procession to the grotto, and that I was to tell the priests that she wanted a chapel built. After saying this, Bernadette's attitude changed. Her voice became tender and her eyes became glazed as they recalled March the 25th, 1858, the Feast of the Annunciation. She was smiling and gazing at the crowds like a mother watching her children. I knelt and said the rosary, and when I'd finished, the lady came down from the niche and awaited me in the cavern. I stood up and went slowly towards her. Then I said, Madame, will you have the goodness to tell me your name? She smiled at me but didn't answer. Oh, please, will you tell me your name? Again she smiled and remained silent. So then I stretched out my hands towards her and begged, Please, please, madame, what is your name? The lady's smile faded, and a look of seriousness came over her face. She parted her hands, stretched them towards the ground, and then joined them again at breast level, and finally, raising her eyes to the sky, said, I am the Immaculate Conception. Bernadette stopped speaking and dropped her hands to her sides. While relating this scene, she had spontaneously mimed every gesture of the lady. Breaking the silence, Sister Vazou had one more question to ask. Having heard that Bernadette had been entrusted with some secrets, she wondered why no mention had been made of these. What about the secrets, then? Aren't you going to tell us anything at all about them? But Bernadette, as was her custom, eluded the question, and the meeting came to an end. That evening, Bernadette was handed over to Sister Dubot who was to be her guardian angel in the next few weeks. She showed the new postulant around saint Gilda, taught her the ways of convent life, the exercises of the novitiate, and in particular, the importance of keeping the rule. Despite the companionship of Sister Dubot, Bernadette, during her first week, was deeply distressed. She missed Lourdes, she missed the grotto, she missed her family, and although she did her best to hide the fact that she was more often than not in tears, her red eyes betrayed her. But Bernadette overcame her grief, and in a letter to her parents she wrote, I am settled and very happy, and I beg you not to be anxious about me. Sunday, July the 29th, 1866, was the day of the clothing ceremony. Because Bernadette Subaru's postulancy had begun at Lourdes six months earlier, she was eligible. And thus, on this day, just three weeks after arriving at saint Gilda, the young woman replaced her blue striped dress for a white one and with the other postulants filed into chapel. There to greet them was Monsignor Focad, the Bishop of Nevers. And before a packed congregation of nuns and visitors, 
Bernadette Subaru received the novice's veil and her name in religion. From this day forward, she would be known as Sister Marie Bernard, the name recorded in the register at Lourdes 22 years earlier on the day of her baptism. On that particular day, January the 9th, 1844, just two days after her birth, there had been no bishop and no large congregation. Around the font in the bleak baptistry of St. Peter's, the parish church of Lourdes, huddled a handful of people as the first-born child of Francois and Louis Subaru received baptism. But to welcome the new member, the church bells rang out after the ceremony as the group made their way back to the house where the baby had been born. This was the Bowley Mill, one of the several that lined the banks of the swiftly flowing Lepaka River, north of the town. Though lured with its cluster of pale grey houses, narrow streets, uneven pavements and passages was hardly prepossessing, the magnificent outcrop of rock upon which was built the castle stronghold of Mirambel and the grandeur of the surrounding snow-capped Pyrenean peaks made the place one of rare beauty. It was in the shadow of this dominant fortress that Bernadette grew up. Until the age of six, she was a strong, healthy child. But then she began to suffer from asthma. This caused her to have choking fits, which left her fighting for her breath. And so, when a cholera epidemic swept the town five years later, Bernadette was a ready victim. Although she made a remarkable recovery, her condition remained delicate. She was never fully able to take part in the games and activities with the other children, and even her growth was retarded. But she worked hard. Her parents, as mill owners, had started off their married life in reasonably prosperous circumstances, but due to mismanagement and generosity, they lost everything and ended up by moving into the only place made available to them, an old condemned building called the Casho, which at one time had been a prison. The front room of the ground floor was used as a workshop by a stonemason, while the Subaru family, which now numbered six, occupied the back room. It was small, dark and damp. In fact, nothing but a fetid hole, and the two barred windows were a grim reminder of its previous usage. Once the family had moved in their pitiful belongings, Bernadette took over running the home while her hard-pressed parents tried to get work. Francois could only get odd jobs, and this was doing work that other people would not. For Madame Subaru, it was not so difficult. There was always a place for a hard worker in the better-off houses doing the washing and general cleaning. Bernadette's sister, Toinette, went to school, while she herself could not, at least not on a regular basis, for when her father was fortunate enough to get a day's work, Bernadette looked after her two little brothers. She washed them, dressed them, and despite the exhaustion caused by her restricted breathing, played with them, more than happy to help them forget their empty stomachs. Bernadette quite frequently said to neighbours, School? No, books were not meant for me. I'm always ill. Besides, I'm needed at home. Anyway, when I do go to school, the sisters really don't know what to do with me. I can only write a few strokes on the slate, not even letters, and I don't know how to read. She certainly was needed at home, not only in the day either, for when her mother came in exhausted, the two of them set about mending the already worn-out clothing by the light of a stump of candle. Then, while Bernadette put her baby brothers to bed, Louise went to the woods to get sticks for their fire. On this particular day, it was February the 11th, 1858, the weather was bitterly cold, and a low, damp mist hid the mountains. Francois Subaru was still in bed, the only place where a bit of warmth was to be found. We're out of wood, said Louise. I'm going to look for some before I go to work. Without waiting for an answer, she opened the heavy wooden door of the cachot, just as Jeanne Abadie was about to enter. Hello, Louise. Where are you off to? I'm going to get some sticks for our fire. Oh, you needn't bother. We'll go. She looked at Bernadette and Toinette. Yes, said the two girls together. Please, Mama, let us go. Well, Louise looked doubtful. 
It's all right for you, Toinette, but Bernadette... I'll be all right, Mama, please. That's all very well, Bernadette, but you know how easily you catch cold. Oh, Mama. Well, all right, then. Uh, but put on your cape. Happily, the three ran off and made for the woods. Once there, Toinette and Jeanne went on ahead and became so engrossed in their project that they forgot all about Bernadette. And when they returned a little later, they were amazed to see her kneeling motionless. Bernadette! Bernadette! Toinette called, and receiving no answer, she threw stones to attract her sister's attention. Bernadette did not respond at once, but after a while she stood up and joined the other two. On the way home, they bombarded her with questions until she eventually told them that she had seen a beautiful lady in the old cavern. Please don't tell anyone, she implored. But they were unable to keep this a secret. And as a result, Bernadette was forbidden to go to Massabiel again. Before long, though, she felt the urge to go back again, and once her parents gave their permission, she did so. After she had been to the grotto several more times, the local constabulary, noting the stir it was causing, felt obliged to intervene. And so began a whole series of interrogations, when in turn, Monsieur Jacomet, the chief of police, Monsieur Vital Dutour, the imperial prosecutor, and Baron Masset, the prefect in charge of the High Pyrenees, did their best to confuse and even intimidate Bernadette in an effort to get her to admit she was lying. These men didn't ruffle Bernadette, but when the lady asked for a chapel to be built and people to come in procession, her heart sank, for this meant facing Abbe Peremal, the quick-tempered parish priest of Lourdes. "'Ha! Ah, so it's you that goes to the grotto, is it?' said the abbe, after she'd introduced herself. "'You're the one who says she sees the Blessed Virgin.' "'I've never said I see the Blessed Virgin.' Then what exactly do you see, young madam? Is it something or someone? It's a lady, and she told me to give you a message. Well, what is it? The lady wants people to come in procession to the grotto. What? With the message imparted, Bernadette curtsied and hastened away. She had not gone very far before realising that she had not passed on all of the message. It was not until evening that she plucked up the courage to return to the presbytery. This time she found it more difficult because in the study with Abbe Perimal was one of his curates, Abbe Pamin. Monsieur le Curé, I forgot to tell you all of the message. The lady at the grotto told me to tell the priests to build a chapel at Massabiel. And what is the name of this lady? I don't know. She never told me. Have you asked? Yes, I have, but she doesn't answer. And she told you she wants a chapel at Massabiel? Yes, Monsieur Le Curé. Have you gone mad in the head? A lady standing on a rock? A lady you don't know who wants a chapel at the grotto? And you accept these messages? And we're supposed to carry them out? I'm just telling you, Monsieur. Ah! So you're a comedian as well? Oh, really, you are quite ridiculous. You command me? Do you have the money for this chapel? Eh? Eh? Bernadette emptied the contents of her pocket onto the desk. Just one rosary. Listen, I want proof of all this. You tell that lady of yours I want a sign. Uh, let, me, let me see now. Oh, yes. If she wants a chapel, tell her to make the wild rose bloom at the grotto. Bernadette smiled at the bewhiskered face. Yes, Monsieur Le Curé, I'll tell her. Picking up her rosary from the desk, she curtsied and left the room. But before the door closed, she popped her head back in and said, Just a little one, monsieur. What? What's that you're saying? Just a little chapel, monsieur. Bernadette did not hear his reply. She had already disappeared. The lady had asked Bernadette to go to the grotto for two weeks. Those two weeks were now up, and the girl stopped going but the people did not. Although the Subaru family were kept under close observation by the police, life took on some semblance of normality. But now the press began to go to town. In the beginning, only the local Lourdes paper had reported the goings-on at Massabiel, but gradually the news spread until on March the 9th, 1858, 
all the great Parisian dailies carried the story. As a result of this, Baron Massé, the prefect, and Monsieur Dutour, the imperial prosecutor, came under fire from the Minister of Public Worship, who demanded exact information about these so-called apparitions. In a letter he said, It is your duty to keep me informed of all religious occurrences. In reply to this, both men sent him reports, and at the same time stated that all necessary precautions had been taken to restore order. Monsieur de Tour and Massey also expressed the feeling that the incidents at Massabiel would die a natural death. But it was not enough to write reports. The harassed officials decided that something must be done, and so they sent for the girl who was causing all the trouble. And at the town hall, she was questioned first by de Tour and then by Monsieur Jacomet. When asked by one of them if she would go to Massabiel again, she replied, I don't know if I'll go to the grotto any more. The lady didn't tell me. But three weeks after the last apparition on March the 25th, the Feast of the Annunciation, the lady called her again, and at last said who she was. As soon as the lady had disappeared, Bernadette stood up and ploughed through the crowds who hemmed her in on all sides. Murmuring to herself, and quite unmindful of everyone, Bernadette made a beeline for the town. Neither she nor her lips stopped until the presbytery was reached, and there she burst in on the astonished abbe. She said, I am the Immaculate Conception. What? What's that? Monsieur le Curé, the lady at Massabiel said, I am the Immaculate Conception. What are you talking about? No one can have a name like that. You've made it up. Do you know the meaning of those words? The girl shook her head. Then why say something you don't understand? But I'm only telling you what the lady told me, and I've said the words over and over again so that I'd be sure to get them right. The abbe's temper died at once, but not wishing to show his emotion, he said abruptly, All right, my child, go home now. I'll speak to you another time. Abbe Perimal had been taken aback by the news, but before he could decide what action to take, he was informed by Monsieur de Tour that the grotto was to be barricaded up. As the weeks went by, however, the townspeople repeatedly pulled down the wooden fences, only to see them put up again. And on July the 16th, 1858, the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, the fences were very firmly in place when Bernadette felt an irresistible desire to go and see the lady. Avoiding forbidden ground and accompanied by one of her aunts and some friends, she went to the Ribeir Meadow on the other side of the Gar River. The sun had just set and a few groups of people knelt silently saying their prayers and no one noticed Bernadette in her dark-coloured hooded cape. She knelt and then asked someone to light the candle which she held and all began to say the rosary. Bernadette looked towards the niche away in the distance, but only the upper part showed above the rough barricades. Her distressed gaze searched the area and came to a rest on the nearby bank of the Garve, where it joined the Savi stream. Her silent companion saw the kneeling girl's face turn pale, her skin go taut, while the brown eyes widened and became glazed. Later that night she told her family, the lady was more dazzling and vivacious than ever before. The golden roses on her feet were brilliant. Her veil and hair flowed freely, and her smile was more loving than ever. We didn't speak. We just gazed at each other. I raised my hand to wave, and then there was nothing, only the darkness of night. In the weeks which followed, Massabiel was like a battlefield as gendarmes with swords drawn tried to control the ever-increasing numbers who defied the decree. Arrests were made and fines imposed on those who took water from the spring, but it made no difference and people still forced their way into the grotto. On October the 2nd, this state of affairs was at last resolved when the Minister of Public Worship informed the Bishop of Tarbes that he had spoken with the Emperor Napoleon III. My lord, he wrote, his majesty wishes that free access be given to the grotto. He also informs us that people are at liberty to use the water from the spring. The battle for the grotto, in which the Subaru family had taken no part, 
was over. During this time, they had quietly gone about their business. At the Grau Mill, where they had moved from the Cachot, Bernadette had a room to herself, but even so, there was very little peace from the constant stream of visitors who plagued her with questions. Not only that, she was summoned almost daily to the presbytery so that different people could see and speak to her. These aggravations continued for many months until, at the instigation of Abbe Perimal, who had become her champion, Bernadette was accepted at the hospice with the Sisters of Nevers as a boarder and began her education in earnest. But the question now most commonly asked was, Bernadette, what do you intend doing with your life? Her reply never varied. Shrugging her shoulders, she said, I really don't know what I'll do. But surely you must have given some thought to the matter. After all, you're grown up now. Nuns too began to call and did their best to interest her in their respective communities. Why don't you become a Carmelite, asked one, or a Trappist, said another. But Bernadette kept her counsel and for the next two years concentrated on her education. On September the 25th, 1863, something unexpected happened. Bernadette, as she usually did during school holidays, was helping out in the convent kitchen. Suddenly the door burst open and one of the sisters, her face flushed with excitement, cried out, Quick, quickly, Bernadette, Monsignor the Bishop of Nevers is here. Go and ring the bell to announce his arrival. Rubbing her hands dry on the large apron she wore, Bernadette removed it and flung it onto a chair and ran to the front porch as fast as she was able and there started to pull the bell rope. What a noise, said the purple-clad bishop who was just mounting the stairs. Dong, 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 that'll do, young lady. Bernadette stopped, smiled, curtsied and hurried away. The bishop did not realise that this was the girl he had come to visit, and so he said to Mother Alexandrine, the superior, You must show me Bernadette, I've come specially to see her, you know. But of course, I don't want her to know that. Yes, yes, I quite understand. The nun replied, Perhaps you'd like to inspect some of the rooms at the convent first, and then I'll take you to where she is. And without waiting for an answer, she led the way. The last call was to the kitchen. There she is, whispered Mother Alexandrine. The tall, jovial man looked towards the chimney corner where the girl who had so recently been ringing the bell sat scraping a carrot. Without speaking to her, the bishop and the superior left the kitchen. Later, when lunch was over, he retired to the parlour and sent for Bernadette. Uh, come along in, my dear. Sit down. How are you? Are you well? Yes, my lord, I am quite well. I am very pleased to meet you. Now, you're not to be afraid because I've sent for you. After what you've seen, why be afraid of me? Bernadette relaxed, and the serious expression left her face. Now, Bernadette, I want you to tell me all about the apparitions. She did so, and the bishop listened attentively. When she'd finished, he said, And so, my child, what are you going to do? Nothing, my lord. What, nothing at all? But, my dear Bernadette, you simply must do something in this life. My lord, why is that? I'm quite at home here with the sisters. Oh, yes, that may well be so, but it's not as easy as that, you know. But why, my lord? Because you're not a sister, and it's absolutely essential for you to be one in order to join the community. Don't you see, as it is now, you're nothing, and at this rate, you will never last anywhere for long. You aren't a child any longer. Maybe you'd like to get settled in the world with a place of your own. She shook her head. In that case, why don't you become a sister? You're happy with them, aren't you? Oh, yes, my lord, I am. But it's out of the question for me to be a nun. I'm poor. I haven't got any money for the diary. Oh, sometimes, my dear, these things can be arranged. Poor girls are sometimes accepted without a diary. But young ladies you take without a diary are clever and quite capable of making up to you for not having money. Me, my lord, I'm a nothing, and I'm good for nothing. Good for nothing? But I saw you in the kitchen a while ago helping Sister cook, and I notice there is something you're good at. Oh, don't worry, you'll be put to good use. Besides, in the novitiate, they will complete your education. 
Raising her head, Bernadette looked at the bishop thoughtfully. All right, now you think it over. Then speak to your confessor if you wish, but above all else, ask the Blessed Virgin to obtain from her divine son the light and grace you need. The light and grace had come to Bernadette. It was now three years later, and as the bishop put the novice's veil on her and gave the name she would be known by in religion, her thoughts went back to the day when she first met the Monsignor in the kitchen at the hospice at Lourdes. Then she wore an old plain dress and a scarf over her head. Now she wore a veil and the graceful habit of a novice. After this ceremony, Bernadette was assigned to help out in both the infirmary and in the sacristy. In her free time, she read. The books mostly made available to her were on the lives of the saints, and these did not particularly inspire her. But these stories are useless, she said. They're so unreal. Why don't they mention these people's bad points? It doesn't say a thing about their faults, their struggles, or what they did to make themselves better. Talking about faults made her become even more conscious of her own. I have a sharp tongue and a quick temper, that's for sure. And of course, I'm rather domineering. That's because I had control of my little brothers at home. The mistress of the novices added stubbornness to the list, which Bernadette readily admitted. I have been headstrong all my life, she said to Sister Vazou. Even at the grotto, I had to be told three times by Our Lady to drink the water. Well, said the woman, you've just got to overcome your faults now that you're a member of the community, and you'll have to work hard at it too. It seems to me that you are full of pride. Anyway, it is not as though you have nothing to help you. There's the peaceful convent life and all the prayer times and periods of silence. That should help you to control yourself. And then you've got me. Don't forget you belong to us now. We'll knock you into shape. Oh, Mother... I do hope you do it gently, said Bernadette. As the weeks passed by, it became increasingly more apparent to Bernadette that as well as the aid Sister Vazou had mentioned to put her on the road to sanctity, God was giving her another, that of suffering. On August the 15th, 1866, Bernadette was put to bed, completely fatigued. By the end of the month, she had become really ill as frequent choking fits threatened to suffocate her. By October, the patient's condition had worsened to such an extent that it was feared she would die. Bernadette realised this and expressed the desire to take her vows. A message to this effect was sent to the bishop while the novice received extreme unction from the convent chaplain. Both Mother Imber and Sister Vazou attended the administration of the sacrament. Afterwards, they left the sick room, and closing the door quietly behind her, Mother Imbert said, The doctor said she will not last the night. Heaven only lent her to us, replied the mistress of the novices. Oh, she shook her head, her soul escapes me. Just then, the bishop came up the stairs and asked, How is she? We're going to lose her. Mother Imbert opened the door and the bishop went over to the bed. The girl had just suffered a severe hemorrhage. She was breathless, and already the signs of death were upon her. The doctor is very concerned about you, my child. It seems that you might well be near the end of your life. If that is so, then I am very grateful to God. I just want to die. I am told you wish to make your profession. Yes, I do. But I haven't the strength to say the words. Well, that's no problem. I shall pronounce them for you. All you have to do is say, Amen. The bishop recited the words, and when Bernadette said, Amen, Mother Imbert spread the veil over the girl's head while Sister Vazou placed a crucifix between her joined hands and the rule book on the bed. Goodbye, my child said Monsignor Focard. Please remember to pray for me when you get to heaven. Bernadette closed her eyes and the bishop left the infirmary. Hardly had he done so when her breath, 
which had been irregular and rasping, suddenly became calm, and she opened her eyes. Taking hold of the patient's wrist, the nurse said, Her pulse is stronger. I shall not die tonight, said Bernadette. What? said Mother Imbert. You calmly tell us that you're not going to die? You knew you were not going to die, and yet you made us get his lordship out at this awkward hour. Now you listen to me. If you're not dead by the morning, I'll take your veil away. Is that clear? Bernadette smiled. As you please, my mother. Later, when she and the nurse were alone, Bernadette said, I'm feeling better. God didn't want me. I got as far as the gates and he said, Go away, you've come too early. From this day on, she steadily progressed in health, although her convalescence was slow, and confined as she was to four white walls, she naturally enough became depressed. But, as another patient observed, she fought her depression by helping others who were sick when she was permitted out of bed, and she read books and prayed a lot. Oh, how I loved to watch her praying. But most of all, I loved to watch when she received Holy Communion. It was then that I could see the great love she had for our Lord. She lowered her eyes, and her face was somehow transformed. Really, it was quite heavenly. Hardly had Bernadette recovered from her near-fatal relapse when she had another blow. News arrived at the convent of the death of her mother in Lourdes. Completely worn out from a hard life of work, poverty and childbearing, Louise had died at the age of 41. So great was the grief and tears of Sister Marie Bernard when this news was broken to her, said one of the nuns, that she fainted. She felt that no one could ever take her mother's place. When she came round, however, although she cried a lot, her strong will reasserted itself and she asked questions about her mother's death. Then she said, Our Lady will take my mother's place. She wants me to love only her and to place all my confidence in her. When Bernadette left her bed in the infirmary and returned to the novitiate, Sister Marie-Thérèse Vazou, realising that she could not shape this particular soul to her way, completely changed her attitude toward her. She felt that the young woman was full of pride, and so she immediately set about ridding her of it. To that end, Bernadette was singled out and humiliated to such an extent that one novice said to a companion, How lucky I am not to be Sister Marie Bernard. In the great hall of the novitiate, Bernadette seemed to be forever on her knees kissing the ground in penance, so much so that one day she joked, I'm looking for the tile that I haven't kissed. Another reason which contributed to the harsh treatment of this young woman in her care was Sister Vazou's doubts about Lourdes. To a visiting bishop, she said, Why did the Blessed Virgin choose to appear to such an uncouth and uneducated peasant rather than to a virtuous, well-educated woman? Mother Imbert, too, had the same reserve towards Bernadette, and her attitude was much the same as Sister Vazou, although inwardly she loved this young novice more than any other, and could so easily have spoiled her. Sometimes, though, the Mother General's behaviour was extremely exaggerated, as on the day of profession, when Bernadette was to renew her deathbed vows. Having made their vows of poverty, chastity, obedience and charity, the novices went up one by one to the bishop and received their assignment. Then it was Bernadette's turn. As she knelt before the bishop, he turned towards the Mother General and said, and what about Sister Marie Bernard? Well, I don't know, Monsignor. She really isn't any good at anything. Sister Marie Bernard, is it true that you are good for nothing? Yes, my lord, it is quite true. But, my poor child, what are we going to do with you? I told you in Lourdes that I was good for nothing, my lord, and you said it didn't matter. Mother Imbert intervened. If you like, my lord, we could keep her here and give her a job in the infirmary, even if it's doing the cleaning. And anyway, as she's always ill, this job will suit her admirably. I would try my best, said Bernadette. The bishop gazed at the small figure at his feet, and then he said, I assign you to the task of prayer.
Bernadette could hardly hide her disappointment at seeing her friends leave the mother house to take up their various duties. But it was, in fact, to spare the sister from public curiosity that the protection of Saint Gildas had been decided upon. Not many days after her profession, a nun who was visiting the convent asked Bernadette, Do you ever feel complacent at being singled out by Our Lady for special favours? The Blessed Virgin chose me because I was the most ignorant. If she could have found anyone more ignorant than me, then she would have chosen her. And then she went on, What do you do with a broom? You use it for sweeping, replied the nun. And after you've finished, you put it back in its place behind the door. That is quite so. And that is what happened to me. The Blessed Virgin used me and then put me back in my place. I'm glad of it. And that's where I stay. On another occasion, when speaking to a young novice, she said to her, Humility is like a good perfume. Those who wear it are never aware of it. The manner of her life vouched for the genuineness of Bernadette's humility. Her one desire was to stay hidden, and she went to all lengths to avoid those who sought her out. On those frequent occasions, though, when she was confined to bed, it was easier for people to see her as she could not run away. But not all visitors were as welcome as a young child named Madeleine, who was allowed into the infirmary. Seeing the sister in bed, the little girl stopped in the doorway, joined her hands together in prayer, and stood motionless. Come over here, child. Madeleine did so, and after Bernadette had laid her hands on the little one's head, the child kissed her. Then she put her hands together again and asked, Is it right that you saw the Virgin Mary? Oh, yes. I saw her. I saw her. Was she very beautiful? Yes, she was. Oh, so beautiful. When you have seen her once, you just long to die so that you can see her again. Nevertheless, once she was up and about again, Bernadette resumed her tactics of avoiding people. More often than not, she pulled the veil as low as possible over her face, or she pulled the sides of it closely round her. When questioned by Sister Vazou, she replied, It is my little house in which I hide myself. And so good did she become at remaining hidden that it took a new postulant one month to identify her. Another one, after three days of looking at every person in the community, said to an older nun, It seems very strange, but I just cannot discover Bernadette Subaru. Which one is she? She's over there. The nun pointed towards a tiny figure. What, that? cried out the new postulant in obvious disappointment. Bernadette, who had overheard, came over smiling, and taking the girl's hand said, Yes, mademoiselle, only that. Come, that will show you round the convent. The ready smile and infectious laughter endeared Bernadette to the community, and the humiliation and trial she had to endure did nothing to squash her high spirits. One day, when she was sent to the kitchen for some hot water, she took it without asking cook's permission. Sister Marie Bernard, just you put that water back where you got it from, said the woman. Yes, sister, said Bernadette, and she returned to the sink where she endeavoured to put the water back up the tap. This action so completely disarmed the hitherto annoyed nun that both she and the culprit dissolved into laughter. It was this sense of humour, which was peculiar to her, that caused the young postulants and novices to seek her company, and the sick, too, looked forward to seeing her. Despite what had been said to her on the day of profession, Bernadette was, in fact, given a responsible position. She was officially made assistant to the nun in charge of the infirmary. She nursed us, recalled one of the patients, with infinite tenderness, and she was always cheerful in spite of her own bad health. Sometimes Sister Marie Bernard sang us little songs in patois, and then laughed out loud when she saw we didn't understand the words. For me, no other visit compared to hers. When she came into the infirmary, she bowed to the statue of Our Lady, and then she came and straightened the covers on my bed, took my hand, and always said a little word of encouragement, like, We must suffer for the good of God, 
he suffered so much for us, or when we get to heaven, we'll be happy. But down here... At first, Bernadette did all the menial jobs, like cleaning the floor, emptying bedpans, and changing the water in the flower vases. But eventually, she graduated to nursing the sick. When Sister Foray, the elderly and ailing chief of the infirmary, was periodically herself confined to bed, Bernadette took over. Her humour, authority and counsel created a relaxed and happy atmosphere. Nevertheless, her gaiety did not conceal her deep sense of purpose and commitment, and a depth of soul which, obvious to all others, eluded Sister Vazou. The little sister was highly competent, just as she had been when running the family home in Lourdes. Monsieur Saint-Cyr, the doctor at saint Gildas, wrote of her, Sister Marie Bernard is small and frail in appearance, and she does not look her twenty-seven years. She has a calm and gentle disposition and nurses her patients with considerable intelligence, never omitting anything from the prescriptions which I order. Thus she exercises great authority, and as far as I am concerned... She enjoys my utter confidence. Although she was competent, she never compromised her duties, but carried them out with love and feeling. She was not averse to sitting up all night with a sick patient, and whatever the job, she never shirked it and coped admirably. One of the sisters was suffering from breast cancer. The disease had caused the open wound on the nun's chest to become so repulsive that those helping out in the infirmary could not bear to look at it let alone dress it. A fine sister of charity you'll make, Bernadette scolded one novice. Just what will you do if you get a case like this when you're sent to a hospital to work? Are you going to turn your back on the patient? Always remember, when you're nursing someone, it's our Lord you are really nursing. When Sister Foray died, Bernadette officially succeeded her as head of the infirmary, but she had already been shouldering the work for almost six years and now it began to take its toll. On January the 17th, 1873, she was put to bed in the infirmary. Here I am once more, she wrote to her sister Toinette. It started with a violent attack of asthma which lasted a long time, and then I had a hemorrhage which prevented me from making the slightest movement in case it brought it on again. You can well imagine how being fastened down like this does not suit my impetuous nature. While she was still poorly, she had an added burden. News of her father's death at Lourdes reached her. For a while, Bernadette was inconsolable, but gradually her good sense enabled her to overcome her grief. On Easter Sunday, Bernadette was allowed to leave the infirmary and attend Mass. Within a matter of days, she had a relapse and was put back to bed again. Now Dr. Saint-Cyr intervened and he said to Mother General... I feel that working in the confined atmosphere of the infirmary is making Sister Marie Bernard's condition worse. Besides, the burden of work there is really too much for someone in her frail condition. And so Bernadette was transferred to the sacristy, where, as once before, she became assistant sacristan. I know, said the Mother General, how much it cost Sister Marie Bernard to leave the infirmary. She was very much loved, and her patients miss her a great deal. In the sacristy, the work was much less tiring and better suited to her health. And what did please Bernadette about the change of occupation was the close proximity of the chapel. And because she had more time on her hands, she was able to enjoy what her heart most craved, silence and solitude, which had been denied her in the busy infirmary. Those hours of silence she also shared with Our Lady, sometimes before her altar, and sometimes before her statue which stood in the convent garden. It was quite obvious to all the special place Mary had in this nun's heart. It is as if the Lady of Massabiel had never left her, said one of her companions. When I asked her one day if the apparition had faded from her memory, she said, Forget her? No, never. And putting her right hand to her forehead, she said, It's there. And do you know, whenever she prays to the Blessed Virgin, it seems as if she still sees her. And if any of us ask her to obtain a favour, she always says, 
I'll go and ask Our Lady about it. And the sign of the cross she makes, it's so beautiful, it's like nothing I've ever seen. It's the same with the rosary. She says the Hail Mary slowly and with great feeling, and when she gets to pray for us sinners, she really emphasizes those words. Although Bernadette had more time at her disposal for prayer, she knew penance more than anything else would help to save sinners. In fact, so single-minded was she in this endeavor that when one of the sisters asked, do you pray for the holy souls, she replied, yes, I do, but at least they are sure of going to heaven. I prefer to pray for sinners. They might perish forever. One of her biggest sacrifices was that of Lourdes. In order to help save sinners, she decided never to go there again, even though she had many opportunities. I've made the sacrifice of Lourdes, she said. I shall see Our Lady in heaven, and that will be better. And what a sacrifice this was. It meant that never again would she see the magnificent Pyrenean countryside, the towering mountains, the sheep on the hillsides, and the swiftly flowing garve. It meant, too, not going to the grotto again, or visiting her parents' graves. And then there were her sister and brothers about whom she worried so much, and the redoubtable Abbe Perimal. His death on Our Lady's birthday, September the 8th, 1877, came as a great shock. Sister Marie Bernard was in chapel, said Mother General. When I broke the news to her, she let out such a cry. Oh, Monsieur le Curé, Monsieur le Curé, oh, Mother, I must go outside, that's where I'll find him. And she tottered out of the chapel to pray for him in the grounds. This man, of whom many years earlier she had been afraid, had become her dearest friend, and from the day she heard of his death, she felt that her own was not far away. To one of the novices she said, When you hear that I am dead, pray hard for me. Otherwise, I might frizzle in purgatory. Twenty years had passed since Bernadette had seen the Mother of God at Massabielle, and twelve years since she entered the Mother House at Nevers, and she felt conscious of entering the final phase of her life on earth. She had been in bed for a year, and now had trouble in digesting and retaining food. And besides this, a tumour had developed on her knee and was causing considerable pain. On her better days, the nun was allowed up for a while, and when possible, on Sundays and feast days, carried into chapel for Mass. During the autumn of 1878, Bernadette prepared for her permanent vows. Each year she had renewed them, but now, publicly, she was to make them for life. The ceremony took place on September the 22nd, the Feast of Our Lady of Sorrows. It was around this time that Bernadette began to suffer mentally. As she considered her life, so she believed herself to be unworthy of so many privileges. It is painful not to be able to breathe, she said, but to suffer from inner torment is dreadful. I'm afraid. I've been given so many graces and favors, and I've made so little use of them. Her agony went so deep that she even believed that her spiritual life was collapsing, and that as a nun she was a complete failure, so her torment continued. And then, on December the 8th, the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, she went to chapel for the last time. Three days later, she became permanently bedridden. Chronic asthma, consumption, severe hemorrhages, and the tumor on her knee all conspired to cause unrelieved distress. Oh, my poor sister, you are going through it, said one who was nursing her. Yes, Bernadette answered, but don't pay any attention to my contortions. I suffer, yes, but I'm glad to suffer. I'm prepared to put up with anything for Jesus, anything to help save sinners. The tumour on her leg grew enormous as her bones rotted, and the pain became so intense that eventually the diseased leg had to be rested on a chair outside the bed, though sometimes it took the nurse an hour to find a position which gave her less pain. The slightest movement caused great agony, and the little sister did her best to restrain her cries, especially throughout the night. 
Yet, despite her exhaustion, Bernadette Subaru still endeavoured to be of use. During Lent 1879, she made an effort, as she had done in previous years, to paint pictures on Easter eggs for the Nevers orphans. On some eggs she painted hearts. Because, she said, people no longer have hearts. On others she drew crowns of thorns. They are to remind us that our Lord only gives his crown of thorns to his friends. Of her suffering she said, It's nothing compared with what our Lord went through, but if the little I can do helps save sinners, then I am happy. When the pains grew unbearable, or when she was made to swallow food or distasteful medicine, she said, This is for the big sinner. And who is the big sinner? Oh, the Blessed Virgin knows him well. On March the 20th, such was her agony that Dr. Sancier thought her end was near, and so it was suggested that she receive the sacrament of the sick. At first, the invalid was reluctant. No, no, I don't want extreme unction. Every time I've received it, I've been cured. Nevertheless, she was anointed, and afterwards, in a voice much stronger than usual, turned to the Mother General and said, I have been such a nuisance to you all. Ever since I've been here, I've caused you trouble. Please, Mother, please forgive me. And will you tell my companions that I am asking their forgiveness for the bad example that I have set them? Indeed, as Bernadette surmised, she did regain some strength, which didn't please her. She only wanted to die and go to heaven. Heaven, heaven, she murmured continually. They say that some saints did not go straight to heaven because they did not long for it enough. That won't be so in my case. Don't worry, said Abbe Fabre, the convent chaplain. You'll be up there enjoying it soon enough, and Our Lady gave you some idea of what it would be like. Oh, yes, you're right, and how that does me good. Well, then, be brave, sister. Remember Mary's promises. Heaven awaits you at the end of all this. Yes, I know, but the end is a long time coming. During Holy Week, April the 6th to the 13th, 1879, her agony intensified. The disease had run through her whole system. There was hardly any skin left on the lower parts of her body, and the sores which covered her opened up and merged, so that she felt she was burning up. Courage, sister, said the abbe. Let your sacrifice be made generously. Bernadette looked at the man. What sacrifice do you mean? Why, my good sister, I mean the sacrifice of your life. Ah, oh, that is no sacrifice. It is no sacrifice at all to leave a life in which it is so difficult not to offend the good God and where there are so many crosses. During this week, all the little holy pictures pinned to the white bedside curtains were, at her request, removed. I only need my crucifix now. I am like a grain of wheat which is being ground. I would never have believed it possible to suffer so much in order to die. Throughout her agony, Bernadette had never feared or doubted that she would go to heaven. But on Easter Monday night, a more severe form of mental torture began. Oh, I'm afraid, I'm so afraid, I have received so many graces, so many, and I'm worried that I have not used them as I should. All that night she was in a cold sweat, and her cries were terrifying. Periodically she called, Get out, Satan, get out! At last the morning came, and she was easier. When Abbe Fabre arrived, she said to him, the devil tried to frighten me in the night. He tried for a long time and then went to throw himself on me. But I said the name Jesus and quite suddenly he disappeared. The mental struggle and the anguish it caused was over. Not so her physical pain. Wednesday, April the 16th dawned and still her emaciated shrunken body writhed in pain. Just after 11 o'clock that morning, because she seemed to be suffocating, Bernadette's little body was gently lifted from the bed and placed in an armchair in front of the fire. One hour later, her condition worsened, 
and someone went to fetch Abby Fabra while those nuns gathered in the infirmary knelt beside her. You are now on the cross, dear sister, said one of them. Bernadette looked at the crucifix on the wall and said, Oh, my Jesus, how I love him. I'll ask our Immaculate Mother to give you consolation, said the nun. Oh, no, please, no consolations, but I need strength and patience. All suffering is good for heaven. Bernadette's eyes turned towards the statue of Our Lady on the mantelpiece. I saw her. Oh, yes, I saw her. And how I long to see her again. She was so lovely. Prayers for the dying began, and Bernadette followed these with great concentration, while her hands clasped her crucifix with tenderness and confidence. When the abbe arrived, her breathing was heavy and uneven, but she was fully conscious. After again giving her absolution, which she requested, he asked her to say the word, Jesus. The moment she had done so, Bernadette stared out into space as if she saw something. Her face, wrapped in radiant surprise, was transformed. Supporting herself with her hands, she leaned forward the better to see, and then came a great exclamation of wonder. Oh! 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 She fell back into the chair and rested quietly for over an hour. Just the two infirmary sisters remained with her. Shortly before three o'clock, the assistant to the Mother General, on her way out of chapel, felt a sudden urge to hurry back to Bernadette. As she entered, the dying sister, still feeling she had failed in her duty during her years as a nun, stretched out her arms towards the superior. Please, please forgive me. Pray for me. Oh, please pray for me. The three religious knelt closely around her and prayed quietly. Bernadette joined in in a low voice. At three o'clock precisely, a most dreadful expression of desolation and abandonment swept over the little sister's face, and extending her arms like a cross, she cried out, My God! My God! I thirst! A cup was put to her lips, but before touching the offered liquid, Bernadette found enough strength to make one last gesture, the large and beautiful sign of the cross, which, twenty-one years before, she had been taught to make. She drank a few drops of water, and her lips were wiped. Her head inclined to one side and rested on the arm of one of the nurses. Instinct told the three kneeling women that this time it really was the end, and together they began the Hail Mary. At the words, Holy Mary, Bernadette joined in. Mother of God, pray for me, poor sinner, poor, poor sinner. Then she was gone, gone to the one she longed to be with, gone to the one to whom, twenty-one years before, she had waved a sad and poignant farewell while kneeling in the Ribere meadow which overlooked the barricaded cavern. On that day, the lady had looked more vivacious and more lovely than Bernadette had ever seen her. She was ringed in light, and everything about her shimmered in dazzling splendor. From her free-flowing veil and hair to the golden roses on her feet, 
and her smile was all loving. So indelible was the memory of the beauty of Our Lady that Bernadette, many years later, in her sick bed at the convent of Saint Gildas, could still say, When you have seen her once, you just long to die so that you can see her again. <laughs>